Good morning. Let's go ahead and start this morning off worshiping the Lord.
If you have your Bibles, take them out and turn with me to Luke 17, 10. Luke 17, 10. I, uh, I was thinking, we watched the uh, Cleveland win the World Series this year, and they'll be named the Guardians. I, I'm not stuck on the name Indians, but Guardians is a stupid name. Amen. When they renamed it, I always thought they should have named it the Cleveland River Fires. <laughs> Remember, was it like 1979, the river was actually burning because it was so polluted? It'd be a great name for a baseball team. You gotta have a little fun with your history. <laughs> Big game today is what? Uh, Buffalo and Kansas City. So, if you ever have trouble sleeping at night, you wake up at night. I wake up every two hours. I sleep in two hour chunks. Is that a, is that a, is it getting older thing? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, and that, and, uh, I punched Judy last night, and she grabbed my arm. <laughs> she was doing this itsy bitsy spider thing, like, up my arm, literally. And I moved my arm, and she's like, I mean, you're asleep, just dead on, just nail it. But then later on, I was, I sleep so I don't know why my arm was up in my hands, but, it hit her. I think she even said, hey! <laughs> so, yeah. so, we, it, it might be time to go to a king size bed. Right? We never had a king. Maybe it's about time. Put a partition up or something. I don't know. It's, it's so I love Lucy style pair of twins. Nah, yeah. I can't, I can't do that. Maybe that's why people say sleep two hours at a time. Because you're, Maybe I'm like, you're kicking me to punch me. I woke up, I was hungry last night. I'm always hungry. I, I used to, about every night I wake up and have to get a protein bar or ice cream bar. Last night I had an ice cream bar and a protein bar and a diet root beer. <laughs> While I was on the diet root beer, AW diet root, that's why I love diet root beer. Uh, and when I was in the Navy, I would always wake up in the middle of the night and I'd go down to the, what, what you, get snacks, candy, and on a ship it's called the Ghee Dunk. Military, you go to the Gee Dunk. So I go to the Gee Dunk and I get a, I get a, a Pepsi free, I think, because they had to serve with no caffeine. So I'm trying to sleep. I had a theory when I was in the Navy and I was on the ship the longer I slept, the less time I spent on a cruise. So I would try to sleep the, as much of the cruise away as I possibly could. I'd be like, hey, if I just come down and turn it over so I don't get bed sores. Um, but I get a, I get a Pepsi Free and a and a uh, Butterfinger, and then I'd be ready to go back to sleep. So, but I was up last night. It was about two o'clock in the morning, and so I, while I'm eating my snack, and I'm looking, I pull up Facebook, and I wonder was was Jen 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 was Jen up at two o'clock in the morning? Because I look at my phone, and all of a sudden the post of her pops up on my phone about the girls licking you girls. Uh, I'm like, hey, either this just came through or Jen's up just like I am. <laughs> Luke 17, 10, it says this. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And I'd like to preach for a while this morning for the subject, the function of duty. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help me to teach uh, accurately. Lord, not only your word, but Lord, what it is that you want to communicate to us here today. Lord, we look forward to it, uh, not only hearing it, but also putting it into practice. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a duty can be either a moral duty, or sometimes there are even duties that are legal duties. You are required by law if you hold this position to fulfill this duty. I believe God has moral duties for us, duties as a part of us as, our, as being Christians, Things that we are expected to do because of our position as a Christian. Marion Webster defines a duty as obligatory task, conduct, service, or functions that arise from one's position. And I was happy to see when I read this, this definition that it has the word and includes this idea of a function. A duty is one thing, one thing that we have an obligation to do. But as I was thinking about this in, in uh, preparing for this, because where this thought originated was, okay, I think duty is important, and I believe that God has duties for us as Christians. But then the, the additional thought was, okay, we have duties, 
But what is the purpose or the function of those duties? It's one thing to understand, like, this is expected of me. But as it is with God, it's always beneficial to understand that not only is this expected, this is why it is expected. There is a meaningful, productive function to each of us carrying out our duties. And God's word is full of duties, far more than what I'm going to be able to get to here this morning. But it is important to understand that as Christians, we have numerous duties laid out in Scripture. And they are not to be burdensome because if we understand all of them, there's a reason God has given us these duties. Because they produce, there's a function to them that produces something that is beneficial either to us or the people that we come into contact with and certainly ultimately for his kingdom. Um, one little illustration I'll, I, I'll use just to kind of lay the groundwork here is the, the function of a husband, a husband and a father. A husband and a father has a duty to provide for his family. Now that duty is that it falls ultimately to him. That's his responsibility. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, he's the one tasked by God with the duty to make sure that his family is provided for. The function of carrying that duty out is that the family is provided for. So the duty is to provide, the function is, is that they're provided for, the needs are met. So I want to look today at some of these uh, ideas more closely in the Bible about the, the duties that God has for us. But more importantly, what is their function? Why does he call us to do these duties so to see what they produce? So I want to go back to our opening passage, Luke 17, 10, and it says this. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say... We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. In this opening passage, we see that there is a servant. And I'm going to use the word here today instead of servant for our context. I'm going to use the word employee. How's that? Okay. So when we are in the employment of somebody, when this opening passage is used the word servant, but we'll say as an employee is used here as an example. When you are an employee... We are to do what is expected of us, that that job requires. And when it says when it's all said and done, we shouldn't expect anything other than we simply did what, was, what we were supposed to do. We did our duty, and nothing more should be expected than that. <clears throat> I'm going to use myself here as kind of an example. I think I actually mentioned something along these lines here recently. I don't know if it was here or was in some other context. But I have a lot, unfortunately, I know a lot of pastors, a lot of pastor friends, who get upset when there's like a Christmas rolls around or pastor appreciation or something like that and they don't get any kind of like bonus or a gift or you know sent on a trip or something like that and they're they're all offended that they didn't get this thing. And I've never understood that. You know what? I never get upset if something like that happens because I don't expect it. It's not owed to me. As an employee, that is not a part of the contract we have. But my duty as a pastor, I do have a duty. I have a duty to the church body. And the function of me acting and carrying out the duty as a pastor is to care and direct this church body. The duty of the church is to compensate me with the salary that we have agreed upon in advance. And the function of them carrying out that duty is so that I can set aside ample time for me to carry out my duty. That's all there is to it. That's the agreement we have. There's a duty on my part. There's a duty on, on, on I guess, your part. And there are functions to both of those duties. Anything beyond that is not to be expected. If you get it, it's called a blessing. Call it a bonus. Call it whatever you want. In, in your church, we call it a blessing. If we get more than that, it's a blessing, and we should be happy. We should be appreciative for that. So does, it, does this make sense what I'm saying to you? Right? Do, you do you get my point here? Um, so let's look at some, again, as I said, some, bi some biblical examples, and there's a lot more than this that I could get into. But let's look by going to Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 7. We'll start there and, and kind of follow along this line of employees. Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 7. And it starts off, slaves, we'll say employees, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor with, uh, when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, 
doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were deserving the Lord, not men. So all Christians have a duty to be good employees. I absolutely believe that. Doesn't mean you're always going to like it. Doesn't mean it's always going to be fun. Doesn't mean it's always going to be the jobs that you want to do. But we have a responsibility that if we have agreed to an employment uh, contract of some type, that we have a duty to be good employees. Why? What is the function of being a good employee? Well, the employer might say so that the job gets done, and I guess that that's true. <clears throat> but from God's perspective, it's much more than that. It's much more important than that. He says that ultimately the function of being a good employee is because ultimately we are serving him. We are serving God, not simply our employer. As employees, the function of doing a good job is to win the favor of those whose eyes are upon you. So that could be your employer. It could be your co-workers. If you have and you put on the label yourself as a Christian, and don't worry, I'm not going to do this. My whole message isn't about being an employee, okay? I can tell you're already nervous. Uh, the whole function, though, of being an employee, if you put the label Christian on you, is you are an example of for Christ. Shouldn't we do that well? If we're going to put that label on ourselves, we better be good examples. What's it like if you go into the workplace and you grumble and you have conflict and all those things all the time? He says we should serve wholeheartedly because we are serving God, not simply our employer, and we do it to win favor because that is the equivalent of serving God. Serve wholeheartedly, verse 7 says, as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Let's go to T Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. For Titus 2, verses 9 and 10, teach slaves, or I'll say again, I'm going to change the word employees, to be subject to their masters and everything, or employers and everything, to try to please them and not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching before God, about God, our Savior, attractive. We can be witnesses for God, make the gospel attractive just simply by showing up and doing a good job. Especially if we have the label Christian and the people around us know that. The duty of an employee, employee is to be subject to their employer. That's the duty. The function of carrying out that duty is to be a good example being like Christ. And setting a good example of his gospel. It says that it makes the teaching of God, our Savior, what? Attractive. When we look at something that attracts us, we it draw the word means we're being drawn to it. I certainly have been guilty of this at times. I'm not proud of it. I felt great conviction over it. But I I have uh, Certainly had a history at times of being a lousy employee. The only job I've ever been fired from was working for my dad. <laughs> I deserved it. Okay. Uh, they frown on fighting on the job when you're supposed to be doing other things. Uh, so don't come back to work tomorrow. Uh, I once uh, felt like I was being given a job in the Navy that was beneath my, my rank, uh, to which uh, I took my stripes Ripped them off my sleeve, threw them on the ground, and stomped on them. That was really stupid of me, okay? I was really, really, really lucky. I was told, oh, you don't want those stripes? Well, then you're not putting them back on. Um, I've certainly been guilty of being, it's, it's not always easy to be, but as, as a Christian, in, in that example, was I being a good, was I making the gospel attractive? Oh, that's what Christians do? One, not only that's the way you act towards people that are your superior, but you have a bad attitude, you complain about everything, you cause them trouble. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't draw people's like, oh, I don't want some of that. Right? That's what it means when it says that we are attracted to it. God wants us to live lives, and even on the job, even sometimes as bad as they can be, to make it attractive to the people that see us Carrying out those jobs to be like Christ and to make the teachings of God, our Savior, attractive. 
I'm going to read two verses together here very quickly, so you might be adequate to see them on the screen. I don't know if you have time to turn in your Bible. Ephesians 6, 9, and then I'm going to read Colossians 4, 1. Now we're going to switch to the employer, if you will. It says, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Colossians 4, 1. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So in this case, master employer. The employer also has a duty to the employee to provide for them what is right and what is fair. Now, the I won't say the illustration, the fact that I tore my stripes off and threw them on the ground, is <laughs> that, that was not right for me to do. However, it came out of the employer, the boss, the supervisor, doing something not wise, not being a good leader. Because even though it was bad the way I handled it, it produced what it needed to produce. People of my rank should have not been carrying out those types of tasks. There were other people, more junior, that needed to be doing those things, and that's what changed afterwards. I'm glad to say that. So, that was a mistake on both the bosses and the employees, if you will, the, su the supervisor and the subordinates. They were both, we were both wrong in that. Luckily, we got it straightened out. But we need to treat, if, 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 if I and others of my rank because I wasn't the only one involved. I was just always the one. I was always the one in school that stood up for other people. You know that one? That you ever, somebody like that in your, in your way to school bus? Like other people that wouldn't defend themselves when some teacher was, you know, going off on them, I'd end up standing up and getting in trouble. Um, you know, my mom always said I was a rebel without a cause. So now I'm a rebel with a cause. Uh, that's Sure, I'm still, still trying to figure out how that's going to work out in the long run. <laughs> um, if the employer and the supervisor had been practicing good, wise leadership, we would have, I would have never been put into that position. Did I act wrongly? Yes. But I would have liked to have not been put in that position. If we had been treated to do what is right and fair, that would have never happened. So there's obligation in both areas. We have a tendency as people to look at one position as being better than the other, employer, employee. But this reminds us here in Ephesians 6, 9, and Colossians 4, 1, in God's sight, nobody's more important than the other because we're both subordinate to him, amen? He is both of our masters. And we need to keep that in mind as we interact with others. It says, in God's eyes, neither the employer or the employee is better than the other. They simply have different roles to fulfill. And that's the way that we need to look at it when we interact with other people that may that be in different positions. In earthly standards, those positions might seem to be ranked. But in God's position, they're not ranked. They're just different. It's the kind of thing I've always said about, about um, what we see scripturally between husbands and wives. People oftentimes look at husbands and wives and say, one, you know, the husband's above, the, the wife is more, I don't know, more important, more, has more authority, however you want to say it. The way I look at it, and even within the church, you know, one person is preaching the word of God, another person <laughs> is, is, you know, maintaining the facility. One is not better than the other, it's just a different role. Amen. You all, you all know my example about Ruby, right? Ruby? Ruby at our last church, who always made sure Ruby had no skills. Ruby had no gifts. But Ruby was absolutely faithful. That was her gift. 100%. In 10 years at that church, I never worried if there was toilet paper in the bathroom. Because Ruby was on the job. All right? And if she wasn't there, and if she, wasn't there she she'd make sure it was done. But like I said, if you're sitting in the bathroom and you're stuck on the toilet and there's no toilet paper, you don't need me to come preach you a sermon. You need Ruby, right? Both jobs are equally important. They're just different. And that's what God is wanting us to understand. We all have duties. 
but that all those duties have a practical function to them. They produce something. Let's look at Romans 13, 8 through 10. No debt, let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt of love to one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandment, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So what is the duty of every Christian? What are we told is the highest command, the highest duty of God that we should carry out? We should have a continuous debt of love to one another. The highest thing that we can do, the greatest commandment, is to love others, amen, as ourselves. That's our duty. I mean, think about it. It's called, it's a command. It's referred to in the Bible as a command. If God is commanding us to do it, that is a duty. But it's not simply telling us that we need to love one another and love our neighbor as ourselves. There is a function to that love. And the function to that love, we're told here in verse 10, is therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. That is the function of us carrying out the duty that God has given us to love one another. If we love one another, if we love our neighbor as ourselves, then there is a reason for it. There's a function for it. And that function is when you carried out that duty, Randy, Carrie, Margie, when you carried out that, that duty... The function is you have fulfilled God's greatest commandment. There's a reason why he tells us to do it. Galatians 6 verses 6 through 9 says, Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit, he will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will all reap the harvest if we do not give up. Here we see that every Christian has a duty to sow. We are to be sowing good things, godly things, right? The function of that sowing is to reap. So, make sure you sow good seed, because based on what you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And God wants us to reap. God wants us to reap the things that he has prepared for us, the things he has promised us. Of course, our duty, it says, is to sow, and it tells us how to sow. Sow to the Spirit. Meaning, we don't sow to please ourselves. I don't sow for the good of my own flesh. Something that I want, something that I like, something that benefits me. I sow to the Spirit. I sow to the kingdom of God. I sow to what God's will is. So my duty is to sow, but it's to sow to God's thing. And from it, the function from that is, I'm going to reap, it says, eternal life. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good function. I mean, we all want that. That's all of our goals, right? We all want to see that function carried out, but we have to carry out our duty in order, in order for the function to take place. So, so to the Spirit, and from that, we will the function we will reap, we will reap eternal life. And if we do not grow weary in doing good, we will reap a harvest from God. Well, I, I like, I, I'm pretty confident that whatever I harvest from God is going to be good. Since God is perfect and God is love, and God is light. And God, I mean, there's nothing I can. There's nothing I'm going to reap from Him that's going to be a negative. But my responsibility is to is to sow and not to grow weary in doing that, but to continue to do it. And there will be a benefit to us. Romans 12 verses 4 through 8. It says, and again, I, I can go on. I can go on and on and on endless with these things uh, about. You know, that's what God's word is. is it, it lays out our duties as Christians. But here's Romans 12 verses 4 through 8. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesied, let him prophesy. If it is, 
for in proportion with his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. I probably didn't need to read all that, but there's a lot of gifts and a lot of functions within the body of Christ, a lot of things to do. God says every single person has been given a gift or gifts, right? And our duty is to do what? What are we being told here? Our duty is to what? You here today, if you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, you're born again, then you have a gift or gifts. But with those gifts, those are good. God gives them to us. It's a gift, right? We don't deserve it. He gives it to us freely. It's a gift. But once I receive that gift, I have what? I have a duty. I have a duty to use that gift for the purpose for what it was given. If it's prophesied, Prophesy, then prophesy. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's giving, then give generously. That's my function. If I have that gift, my duty is to carry it out. But if I, my gift is, let's say my gift is teaching, I have a duty to teach. And if I'm teaching, then the function of that teaching is what? What, what happens when you're taught something? It means when you're teaching, hopefully people are learning. And that learning from God's word is bringing benefit to them. If it's giving, then you give. That's your, and, the, and the function of that is the people who have need, their needs will be met. But we have a duty to use our gifts. We have a duty to see to it that the free thing that God gave us, we put into <coughs> use in the body of God. So that the entire body becomes better, stronger. And we are dependent on each other. <clears throat> we do this because we are just one member of a larger body. And we're told that here. We're just one member of the, of the larger body. And the function of using our gift is so that the larger body benefits. When we use our gift, let's say, to, to, uh, to teach, it's not simply one person receiving that teaching that benefits. That teaching benefits the entire body. Even if it's giving, but the person has a, you have a gift to give, and you give to somebody in need, that one person benefits, right? But when that one person benefits within the body, because they're part of the body, the entire body benefits. So the function of us carrying out our duty of using our gifts is that this entire body benefits. And that's what God wants, because God says he's given us the gifts for the edification of the body, the building up of the body. He says, he doesn't say nowhere in the scripture that they gave us gifts to build up one person. It always says that these gifts were given to build up the entire body. So I need to use my gifts. I have a responsibility to use my gifts. You have a responsibility to use your gifts. That's our duty. That's our responsibility. Why? So that... God's goal is reached, and that goal is the building up, the strengthening of the entire body, making the entire body more healthy. Does anybody have a problem with being more healthy? In any way, whether it be physically, spiritually, emotionally, however. I mean, if somebody said, hey, you want to be more healthy? You go, no. And then who says no? Now, a lot of us will well, do this, we go, no, I can't do that. But that's a, di that's a different story. I had a friend a while back who uh, posted, uh, I had, he had seen a picture of like our workout area, and he's all like, he's all like, I don't know if it's an elliptical or whatever. I got one of those, he goes, it makes a great clothes hanger. Probably hang my clothes. It's probably not going to achieve what you're wanting but why you purchased it. Uh, I actually designed a little section here I could leave out if I needed to, but I think I'm doing okay. So you could, you could get this. I shouldn't have told you that now. <laughs> Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The, 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 our duty here, we are told, is to what? Be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Renew our minds in God's word. Let God's word change the way we think. That we would think the way God thinks. The function to it is what? That we would know God's will. If I think like God, if I have God's perspective, then I'm going to be able to know what God is thinking. 
and I'm going to be able to know his will, right? If you didn't know somebody, if you, if you went up to a total stranger and they go, what am I thinking? You're going to go, I have no idea what you're thinking because I don't know anything about you. I don't know your personality. I've never seen you operate before. You've never communicated to me any of your passions, the things that you are important to you. you, you I don't know. There's no way I can know. But if I know you really well, and you go, what am I thinking? My wife always knows what I'm thinking, but that's a different story. Um, but, she, but the reason she knows what I'm always thinking is she knows me really well. If we know somebody well, like we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, we know Christ because we know his word, then guess what? I mean, come on. I hear, I used to hear this all the time. Young people, high school, college age, they always said, they want, their biggest thing is, I, what does God want for me? What does God want for me? What does God, what does God want? I want to know God's will. The Bible right here tells us if we know God and the better we know him, the better we're going to know his will. So the, 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 our duty is to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The function of that is so that we can know God's will. And if we can know God's will, then we can do his will. And when we do his will, the kingdom is advanced, the gospel is spread, the body of Christ is built up. There is purpose. God, you know, like I was saying, my sermons are a whole bunch of me up here yapping to make one point. And the one point, you got it, I hopefully you picked up on it by now. God has expectations of us. He has duties for us. But it's not just to do the duty. It's not just do it because I said so. It's do it because it will produce these things. If we carry out our duties, it will produce the thing God knows is important to be produced for ourselves, for the people around us, for the world around us. I am going to skip. I'm going to skip one little passage just, just for you. Let me look at. I want to look at marriage real quick as a as a, as a duty and, and a function. First Corinthians seven verses five through three. First Corinthians seven five through three. The husband should fulfill his burial of duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Husbands and wives have a duty to one another, to their spouses, that their body does not belong to them alone. What is the function of this duty of our bodies belonging to each other? The function is so that Satan will not be able to tempt us because of our lack of self-control. That's about as simple, that's, that's about as good a, an illustration. I, I, I waited to use it. I could have put it at the very first in, in my sermon because it might be about the best, most simple, simplistic, straightforward example of duty and function that there is. We're told they have a duty to one another. And that duty is to carry out the function so that they're not tempted by Satan. Well, that's, not a, that's a pretty good function, right? But that function is only carried out if we fulfill our duties. Another illustration for marriage, sometimes you have to prioritize your duties, okay? There are duties, but sometimes we have to prioritize them. Here's a good an illustration for that for marriage as well. Deuteronomy 24, 5. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay home and bring happiness to his wife he has married. So we know that this man here, this Jew in Israel, here we're looking at in Deuteronomy, he had a duty to his nation, and he was to serve th that nation, the nation of Israel. But in the first year of marriage, the higher duty was to his wife. And all I say, I say that oh, simply to say, sometimes we have to prioritize our duties. And here we're clearly told what that is. I've often thought this. this is, I, I believe this is the way it should be too. If there's somebody, like a young man who's involved in the church, very active, that first year that he's married, he should get out of those things in the church. 
You need that time to establish a relationship and put that marriage on a good, solid foundation. And that takes time. It takes time of being together. And so we're instructed here, you're not to have any other, it says, don't have any other duties laid on them in that first year of marriage. Now, this was, I, 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 this is the Old Testament, but I don't think that that's changed. God has not designed us differently. We're not designed, the human being is not designed differently than he was then. That's the way humans work. And so we may find that there are times that we need to decide what the priority of duties are. And that's where it's good to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can know what God's will is. Hey, God, which one of these is a higher priority right now? Hopefully, if we know him, the better we know him, the better we can do that. 2 Timothy 4, 5. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. <clears throat> the duty of keeping our heads and enduring hardship and carrying out the function of our ministry is to win souls. Because it says... Do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all of the duties. The duties that we have as Christians, whatever form they take, we are to do them well. Because the function of it is it will contribute to the winning of souls. It will contribute to the evangelistic effort of the body of Christ. Do the work of an evangelist. What is an evangelist? It's somebody who what? Wins souls to Christ. Discharge the duties of your ministry. We have a duty as Christians to see to it that what we're doing advances the kingdom of God, sees souls come into the kingdom of God. Let me wrap this, let me wrap this up. <clears throat> Joshua 1, verses 8 and 9. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God puts upon us the duty of doing what he communicates to us in the Bible. Right? He says, do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you're careful to do everything written in it. We have a duty. And I, I, I express it this way sometimes, and you, I'm sure you've heard me say, our job as Christians is not to take our lives and bring the Bible in alignment with it. Our job is to take the Bible and bring our lives in alignment with the work of the Bible. In other words, be careful to do everything written in it. When it tells me that I should be doing something or living in a way that I'm not, I need to change what I'm doing and agree with the Bible. But he says, that's my duty as a Christian. Every single Christian. That's our duty. But what is the function of it? The function is great. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And again, we don't have any problem with that, right? Nobody has a problem with being prosperous and successful. But we are told the function of your duty, it, it, it comes from carrying out your duty. The prosperous, successful life comes from carrying out the duty of doing everything written in God's Word. That's what you, you want to sum all this up I've said here today? That's the way you do it. Do everything the Bible tells us to do. That's our duty. What's the function of it? We'll be prosperous and say, God will bless us. Ecclesiastes 12 13 says, now all have been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man is do is what? Carry out Joshua 1, 8, 9. Do what God tells us. He says that is our duty. Our, it's not, we can look at it as we have free will. And we do have free will. But if we claim to be one of his children, if we claim to be a part of his kingdom, then there is one duty. The whole duty of man is to do God's will. The good news is, is that we are blessed. God has given us duties to men. 
But all of these duties have a purpose. They have a function. Along with many others that I didn't spend time on here today, we have these duties and there's a function. God, um, be good examples of the gospel as, God, as good employees and servants. So that, uh, and the same is true with our, for employees. That's our duty. To always love. And, and, and by doing so, we fulfill the law of God. So the duty is love. The function is fulfilling the law of God. The duty we have to sow. The function is to reap a harvest from God. We have a duty to use our gifts. The function is to build up the body of Christ. We have a duty to bear one another's, this is the one I skipped, bear one another's failings and weaknesses. But we, we do that so that we all have hope. When we build each other up in those hard times, it gives us hope. The function we have to renew our mind, or the duty we have to renew our minds, the function is that we know God's will. We have a duty to give ourselves to our spouse. The function is so that Satan doesn't tempt us. We have a duty to keep our heads in hardships so that we can function so that we can serve effectively as evangelists. And we have a duty to keep God's word so that we are prosperous and successful. The duty of man is to do what God tells us to. But it's not just do it because I told you. It's do it because of purpose. There's a function to it. And I think, I don't know about for you, but for me, that helps me. When I know there's a reason to do what I'm doing, it helps me do it. Certainly helps me do it when I may not want to, but I can see the benefit from it. The function of duty is that God is going to be able to carry out his word, his plan, his will in our lives. And that's what God wants. He wants to see happen. He's, he's got us here because he wants to carry out his will through us. He does that when we are obedient to be dutiful to the things he's called us.